I would like to invite Gennady Roshupkin to the stage. Um, he has the most diverse uh, background I've heard, at least in uh, knowledge. He's an astrophysicist. He is also in computer science. Uh, he is in imaging and genetics, and he will tell you about epidemiology. <laughs> and I can tell you, it's a completely comprehensive uh, talk he will give uh, to you. Yes. So it's Thank still you. Kennedy. Thank you so much for such uh, introduction. So I'm really happy to present today. Uh, and I chose quite a provocative, uh, I think, title about like, how epidemiology can save your AI career. For first thing is that I think that uh, the talk I'm going to give you, it's not only about uh, your, let's say, research career and how it can be applied in research, medical, technical research, but also actually outside academia, in industry, in companies. And I will make some examples today. And second part, what is for me is actually a bit strange because if you would ask me five years ago that I would give this presentation, I wouldn't believe this. It's like because I myself more on AI part, so I'm doing in my research group, we're doing a lot of AI, machine learning, and uh, genetics and medical imaging. But seeing the struggles of my colleague and, uh, and also based on the publications and also different news, uh, I just realized that I'm actually really lucky that I did my PhD partly in the epidemiology department and learned a lot about the epidemiological principles. So and today I want to give you some sense of how it can be useful for you. And of course, to start, I want to start with history of epidemiology. And history of epidemiology actually starts with this person. It is uh, Jon Snow, but not the one from uh, Game of Thrones. <laughs> That's one actually a real uh, physicist, uh, physician from UK. And he's famous because he solved the puzzle of the cholera outbreak in London. So this is the point where the modern epidemiology starts. And he did simple things. So it was outbreak, a lot of people were dying. And it was like a lot of wild hypothesis why it's going on, starting from some like fluid from the river which goes in the night and people breathe it and die and all the things. And he did just a simple thing. He just put, took a map of London and put the cases, uh, as you can see, red dots here where the person lived and died because of this outbreak. And what he found actually that there is like epicenter of this. And that was just a water pump around this. And he realized that actually the disease comes from the water and some bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. It was really difficult to convince back then. There was a lot of famous uh, and other scientists and uh, couldn't believe this. But data told for themselves. So, and he saw this problem. And that's really so that's basically from that point, the current epidemiology starts like it's developing. And uh, I would also recommend, there's a small uh, title, I hope you will share slides afterwards. There's a, a really great book, A History of Epidemiological Method and Concepts, by Professor Alfreda Marabia. So it's really great, a lot of stories about also like how they prove the lung cancer, causing by smoking, etc. So it's not such a simple things. It's really amazing. But what I want to tell you that, okay, that epidemiology is actually the study of what is upon the people. If you just translate, the AP, Demos, and Logos, it's like among people and to study. And you can conclude that epidemiology actually study analysis what, when, and where happened in healthcare and disease conditions for the population. So and you might assume that epidemiology sounds like it's more about epidemic. So let's say COVID epidemia. So and that's actually was really useful. And the examples what Esther told you that would really help to those researchers who would learn, if they would learn epidemiology, to not publish that research. So, but it's all also not only about such type of the epidemics. Let's say if we're talking about dementia, or like stroke or heart attacks, it's also epidemia. So, but just slowly going in the population, not as, let's say, cholera or uh, COVID, it's still uh, worse to apply the same principles. And then I started that, uh, the counting of the epidemiology from the mid of the 19th century. So because since that, this field started to accumulate the principles and ideas how to make your research, how to build your research, how to make conclusions. And it's basically more than 150 years of experience and expertise and a lot of papers published. So in basically, if you look at the uh, diagram, of the evidence of the study, so that in the core of the epidemiology is about how you design your study. So you can start with just case reports, 
treating clinics, and uh, you can go high in the cross-sectional studies, case control studies, some population-based studies, and finally, like, randomized uh, control studies for drugs, and so, so But that's, of course, applied again. So starting from clinical and healthcare research, but you can use this knowledge in any field outside this. And I will show you examples. So the basic idea of the informatives of the study, of course, it starts with your domain knowledge or prior knowledge. Because if you just, for instance, expert in the eye, and you go to date about the COVID, or actually also dementia, downloaded open source data set, so it might not the best uh, approach for you to do the analysis, because you might know something about method, like AI or machine learning, but you don't know anything about dementia or COVID. So, and then your results actually wouldn't make sense, or you really have to consult the professional. So, but another thing is about accuracy of your study. So and there are two components. It's first is validity, so about the systematic error or bias. And second one is about precision. And this is a example that shows, I hope you can see. So this is like a, a aim where you can shoot with dark bullets. And first example, you see that's the perfect case scenario. You have all the shots in the middle, so you have zero bias and really good precision. So in this example, you have quite accurate shots, but the uh, error of variance is quite high, so the precision actually, in this case, precision is not good. In this case, you have really good precision, but you're really off, so your bias is really huge. And this, this is a worst, a worst case example. You have a really bad precision, but also a huge bias. So and that's when you design your study, you have to take this into account. And you can solve this problem by the various approaches. So, but if you start just with the precision, for instance, is one thing. So you want to reduce this like variance and how they uh, distributed your, your results of your experiments, of your study design. So, but in epidemiology, they already realized it quite some years ago that big data doesn't solve this problem. So it's like there's a saying, garbage in, garbage out. So even if you collected millions of samples with the COVID, with dementia, or with your clients on your website. So if the data design is not good, you have bias. So the precision is quite good, but you can have off results. So that's why data doesn't solve this problem. And just to give you examples about what kind of biases we can expect from not even a clinical application. So the first it's like historical bias, so how you collect your data. So, and let's say, uh, this is a famous example, coming back to the diversity, uh, from the, so they have a, such a huge company, they have so many people working for them, and they decide, okay, let's we automate the HR uh, process. So basically, let's train the algorithm, read the CVs, and uh, just uh, invite someone for the interview, let's say, just to make it um, less, uh, work for the HR managers. So, and of course, what they did, they trained the algorithm on the data what they had already before. So and this is like IT company, they collected maybe some years ago data, and what happened that majority of the CVs they trained the algorithm was from the white male, because like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, most of the people in IT was men, so uh, male. So, and of course, what happened that the algorithm they trained was biased, and basically they uh, had to stop to use it because the training and was completely off towards uh, gender. So, but by even like a, so tens of thousands like CVs or data, it does mean that if your design study is wrong, so you have the historical bias in this case, then it can, uh, can really, uh, let's say, your application of your algorithm, learning, deep learning on any analysis can get wrong. So another example, also actually quite famous. So let's say you want to develop a tool for speech recognition. So okay, what would be the best approach? You just say, okay, we can take audiobooks because we have text and we have audiobooks. There's a perfect case scenario. So what can get wrong? So it happened that, well, that's what the, most of the companies did. You can see here different labels and their speech recognition. And here is er error of the speech recognition. So higher me mean, means more errors. 
So, and of course, most of the audiobooks was trained by the voices was talking with like white Caucasian people. That's why in US, all the speech recognition system went completely wrong for African Americans. That's another example of the, if you make your study and you don't know what you're doing, so you can, something can get wrong. It can get a uh, suit later on. So, but that's, that's why, especially for, uh, for industry, but also in healthcare, it's about lives. So in both cases, it's quite uh, damaging. But another thing, so let's make a let's example bias. So let's say you want to just study or also predict salary based on years, how long you work in the certain domain. That's, you got the data, you just computed the mean value, that looks great, you work more, you get more salary. But unfortunately, if you look at the distribution of the different domains, if you are a sportman, if you're in the sport, that doesn't work for you. So actually in sport, you earn more money early in the career than later. So and that's why if you just compute like mean, va uh, mean value or you input for your algorithm a wrong data without, let's say, additional information, then the whole prediction, the whole model can get wrong. So even before you started with learning about machine learning on artificial intelligence, should uh, design or study in a proper way, and in this case, using like epidemiological approach, basically. Another thing is also common today covered also by Essen that let's say a lot of research and AI application in healthcare, but also you run your model, well, you tested it, hopefully, and then that's it. But another thing is to improve your validity or remove your bias. You have to test it outside your study. So otherwise, you can't say anything about your model. So in this is principles, well known for epidemiology, well, basically built on the, a lot of mistakes and wrong publications 100 years before we even invented machine learning and deep learning. So, and uh, that's really important to take into consideration. And I even made a small summary, let's say, the reforms which are used in epidemiology and artificial intelligence. Sometimes, unfortunately, people like invent a uh, wheel, so, and something is already used for years. Let's say like, uh, like you have in epidemiology independent variables, in artificial intelligence you use features. Then actually also some terms might be confusing because in epidemiology precision, as I said, it's about your uh, precision of your study design and experiment. And like in artificial intelligence, this is a variance. But in the same time, in uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence, Precision means something else. So it's more about your predictive, basically predictive value, true positive values. So and there are more and more, let's say, replication, as I mentioned, is you have trained test set or like cross validation in the machine learning community. But also, let's say now it's become more and more popular to talk about distributed learning or federated learning. Well, in epidemiological studies, meta analysis ideas was done already for years. And there are, I'm from AI community trying to invent the way how to do meta-analysis for federated learning, but actually you can just grab papers which published 30 years ago and find your solution. So how I want to conclude, actually, I like this quote that everything new is well forgotten old. So that's why you should pay attention what is published before, what is done before in the community, and that's also important to have this interdisciplinary team when you work on some project. So that's what also was highlighted today. And uh, also that ideas what people doing now in AI sometimes reminds me this figure. So let's say also you want to jump into machine learning on AI. You have to learn a lot of things about how to write code, how to, about data structure, about calculus, statistics. And some people jump and here somewhere should be epidemiology. So, and people jumping over like, yeah, I know now how to do the research. So, and I can recommend a really good book, Modern Epidemiology, for everyone to read. That's a great read, and you can get a lot of inspiration for this. Uh, yeah, thank you for your attention, and I'm uh, happy to the questions. Yeah, thank you very much. 
uh, very clear presentation, a completely different field. Uh, how many statisticians or epidemiologists are here in the room? Anyone who has a nick of uh, going into that field? No, me neither. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was always told by my colleagues that, uh, well, in the future, big data is a solution for everything. And you just convincingly showed it was not. Uh, but uh, yeah, the question is, what is the solution? What is a solution, I could better say, um, if you are looking at uh, the, the problems with the precision and the validity of your data, uh, what could be a solution, for instance, for Esther's uh, studies? to get her predictive models better? Uh, yes, I think that uh, Esther also mentions certain things, so also issues in, your, in her field. So, of course, data, as I said, so there are two things. Of course, data can help you with certain problem, but it does mean that it can solve everything. So another thing is as, uh, also to work in the, at least if, well, there's no one wants to learn epidemiology, but at least you have to work in the, multidisciplinary team that someone can tell you actually this is not the way to do this or it's already like known that that's how it works. Uh, the same let's say with statisticians, right? So if you do some uh, research in clinics and you don't know statistics, you go to the statistician to ask the question. So uh, yeah, so and I think that it's more important to ask the right question. What do you want to do exactly with your study? So the same with machine learning algorithm and AI it can be as good as your data and as good as your question. So that's, I think that's, before you start, uh, you should uh, just really write a way to phrase it and find the right uh, colleagues or right knowledge to uh, prepare yourself for research. Because again, so right now to write some machine learning code, let's say using Python or neural network, it's just 10 lines of code, right? That's just really easy, everyone can do this. And unfortunately that brings this issue that there are a lot of like f false fundi fu fundings, false uh, papers with some research, which just uh, uh, completely outside the field. So, and that's uh, really also like, that will bring in AI, especially in healthcare, the same issue of reproducibility, what uh, we have in like social science. So that indeed is a, is a question of uh, very sound scientific knowledge when you start medical research or any research at all. I think that hasn't changed um, at all. Um, questions from the audience? Yeah, you made quite a dark picture, right? So are there actually examples of things done very well in this field? In the yeah, yeah, so well, that's of course, yes, that's the, my, my message was, of course, to paint it a little bit darker, so then you will pay more attention. If I will tell you that everything is fine, there are just a few results, and yeah, so no, there are a lot, well, actually, like what Esther also showed in her results, so let's say they're doing this AI prediction for dementia, and it's reproducible in different data sets. That's an example of multidisciplinary teamwork, let's say, and there are still researchers doing this, so a, a application for prediction, I don't know, like, skin cancer, like stroke, you name it. So it's, there, there are papers in different domains, they're quite solid. But again, so we as a research community should also control this because there are so many papers, so you will have like say, soon might have like one good study design paper and then 10 with bad design study. That's what you saw also with the COVID. It became like a hot topic last two years, a lot of fundings. And people started to do COVID research who before was doing some, uh, I know, children autism uh, research. And then everyone jumped and got money for like how COVID influenced like this topic or how we can predict this. So I think that's, that's, that's the danger. So that's why I want to kind of bring some awareness, awareness so that you will be aware of this. And just when you do your research, you will be more accurate. AI hasn't changed uh, the fact that you should start with defining the right problem and defining the right method that fits to trying to answer your problem. And uh, the fact that we are 100 years ahead doesn't make a difference. Uh, who of you is working with AI? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A little bit higher, I can't see it. 
You don't, you don't get the microphone, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> About 10 people here working with AI, who of you does not recognize this problem? None. I think it's a very, very clear that it's a real problem, that we should, um, should work on, on uh, trying to solve it. Who of you has an idea of how to approach or how to try different methods to solve this problem already? Yes. Can you elaborate a little <laughs> bit? On the, do you want to elaborate on that? Yes, that's you. It's yes. A question also. Um, yes. Expand, expand. So Can everybody hear it also in the back? Okay, otherwise stand up, please. Yeah. So, uh, before you probably go about framing your problem and question and also to address her issue, wouldn't it be better to, you know, push the medical community to gather more data so that you now have a representative set of, you know, the proportion of the population that has a certain disease? And then to train any of your models, you can sort of make a Yes, yes, I agree. So just to be clear, so when I said this, more data doesn't uh, solve all problems, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't collect the data. So more data is always better. So I showed this plot with these uh, bullets. So in, uh, that was about actually epidemiology, let's say the precision and the validity. But uh, machine learning, let's say you have the same plots showing about the bias and variance, and that's about your complexity of the model and the amount of data, and you have to have a trade-off. So more data can solve certain problem, and definitely you should collect more data. And uh, I'm not completely agree, maybe that can be for the discussion, how open source this data should be. Also do it at privacy, but also do it at the problem that if everyone can download the data, then everyone can run model with these ideas of the epidemiology, let's say, and publish. Uh, maybe not in the highest impact journal, but still publish, and then people start to refer this, and that can be, uh, lead to some problems. So, but definitely more data and uh, more an efficient way to be able to run your models if you're in research, that's definitely. Yes, so not just more data, but then every time you train a model, you can ensure that the data that you use to train it consistently has a representative set of Yes, you mean like just continuous, let's say, de like deployment of the model where you can retrain, let's say, based on new data. Yeah, but basically, like every time you use data to train your model, you make sure that that data is proportionate to the actual population rather than just a random set of data. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. But of course, to make it proportionate to the sum set, it's quite also difficult sometimes. You know, that's the same, like, for instance, even in dementia research, let's say you don't know about disease, again, you just download MRI, and data, and then you run your analysis, and let's say, because you collected data, let's say, from Erasmus and from some uh, children's hospital, from Sophia even. So, and then your algorithm will perfectly predict, but because you didn't match the age of the participant, you know, like you can easily predict uh, age, uh, let's say younger, you don't have dementia, so, and older you have it, so, for instance, the I do agree that it should be like a framework where you can easily do this, and uh, this should be taken into control, the study design, let's say. Yes. May I raise another question? Yes. Because what I experience in business is that we have a lot of medical people who would like to apply data science because the data science is thought to be the solution of everything. And we have a lot of data scientists who do not want to read any book about cardiovascular diseases or any medical stuff because that's too difficult. The data scientists always want to start programming in Python. Yeah. Immediately. Today, download the code and run it. We'll see. Yeah. But what is so striking for me is that these data scientists and these medical experts, they really don't understand each other. They really don't understand each other. <laughs> so they're solving things. And the data scientists are happy because they like programming, which is fun. It's nice. If yeah. it works, it's really fun. It's nice. Yes, you know, yes. But it's bullshit. Yes. <laughs> so funny you don't want to respond to you and Derek because obviously he's a computer scientist, right? And he said, Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. And the thing is, we need to push people from the medical field to gather more data. That's not how it works. <laughs>
it's just it's not something that you can just easily push someone to gather more data. That means you have to not hire another PhD student who has to work four years to gather up a cohort to get more data uh, according to all laws, and then you have to transfer it out of the hospital again. Yeah, but let's not. But because oh, no, I mean, but, but the, just to make sure that we don't actually understand yeah, each other, yeah, so, because but that, that's, I think that's it's a perfect course, example. That's of course the problem. I mean, that's from both sides. So let's say as, again. So I'm working. I was fighting, I said that for me it's strange because I'm more AI and when I started uh, working in epidemiology uh, about genetics and also I was just like, yeah, let's use some machine learning and then community actually also medical community is quite resistant to something new and it's like easy, easy. So like, uh, so it's, I do recognize both problems and of course there should be like a mutual solution. But the problem is, I would say that you don't have people on the top, like companies also, management who understand at least at the both domains because you either have manager again from data scientists or you have in hospital clinician as a, a board of director so and then they don't understand each other so clinician sees okay it's like uh, something we don't really care just do uh, we we more care about the patients and uh, safety etc and then data scientists they're like yeah give me more with ai so that's what uh, I struggle with also students, like if I have a PG student from Delft, that uh, AI is like a hammer, everything looks like a nail, let's just uh, apply it. So nobody wants to think about it, maybe you can solve it with uh, linear regression, you know? So, yeah, but I think that's one thing is just converged, but also I think that there's a lack of people on the high level, like with the boss knowledge. So that's a problem in clinics, I see it also, and also I assume in the in the industry. Yes. Yeah. Oh, a lot of uh, good questions. Hi, a, a little response to your question. Uh, we have an actual uh, um, joint degree in clinical technology just addressing that problem. So, um, and in the new curriculum, uh, which I'm designing with a few of uh, uh, young uh, te technicians, um, uh, clinical technicians, uh, we are implementing a data science line just to address the whole issue discussed, um, well, from bottom up, but um, we are addressing this, yes, it's a huge... Uh, well, yes, as an educationalist for the joint degree, um, and uh, we start the new curriculum and the first data science classes in September. So, um, <laughs> yes? But I think it should go even further. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I would say, Tanya, you need another module. It's just another extension of the study. Sorry, one year more. Any of these considerations, like because there's like in the in the law what they call the data minimization principle. So like in a way, collecting a lot of data, not only like for practical reasons, but also because the, the laws and the privacy of the users are to be respected. And many times it's because we don't really understand how privacy uh, harms uh, people, you know, uh, because uh, well, it's very uh, easy to see how a robot can uh, hit you or how a program may misdiagnose you. But like we need also to think about that, that well, we've been working about data protection for so long and th that is also for a reason, no? And that uh, it not only involves you, it might involve also like your family and like your future generations, whether you want to know these or not. And yeah, and, and I think that in a way, like we need also to have like these um, discussions also with the with the law and ethics because I also understand that from our field, the people don't really know how technology works and like let alone like how medicine works. So it needs to be a sort of 
three-dimensional uh, discussion uh, so that we ensure that at the end of the day, who benefits the most is the user and the patient, not one or the other discipline. Okay, one last question from you. Uh, the ones with the microphone can ask a question. <laughs> Um, I can add to that, we, uh, within the uh, TU Delft, they are busy with um, making the reflective engineer a thing. It's uh, right now uh, being included in the uh, vision for the education. Um, uh, one of our um, past program directors is involved in this right now, so we have close contact with her. And this is a, um, it's about... Um, and reflective engineers, so they need to reflect on the, the work they do. Um, so um, the problem you assessed is, is going to be within that. No, yeah. Okay. I just well, one, comment. One, I comment. I think that it's really important that again, so to have people train in both ways. But again, so it's really important then uh, on the well, again on management uh, level is also appreciated because. You will struggle a lot if you, like even uh, from your master program, say you will find a job and then you all say uh, in the company people like don't see it clinical or only on the technical or other way around. You walk in the hospital and people see it. So it can give a lot of problems. So, unfortunately. Just one last question from here. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to add some supplements about this data set. And I think this is all also about the openness. Because in the Netherlands, the, the pharmacy, there are so many different platforms. The pharmacy has a, has the pharmacy, the GP, the hospital, and even the patient, they got the different platforms. So like, and also this pl platform has a different ownership and they don't really want to share this data. But luckily, the two dev also is working on the sharing platform. They are trying to define the requirements and yeah, well, design for the future. <laughs> <laughs>